We're talking today with James Hine of St. Joseph, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, can you start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, I was born in St. Joseph, Michigan, in uh, on Niles Avenue, which is with the St. Joe Sanatorium, or Terrium, or whichever one is not the, the crazy house. Mm -hmm. Uh, born there and uh, raised uh, on 817 Broad Street, which was a couple blocks away from downtown and uh, one block away from my school, St. Joseph Catholic. I was uh, uh, basically never allowed a gun when I was a kid, never, uh, you know, I was kind of a passive, pacifist that even as a child being born German and uh, right after the war not being really proud of being German and uh, kind of uh, living with that stigma so uh, uh, my parents never allowed me to, ha to have a gun until I you know, was 12 years old when I actually could buy my own actually I worked at uh, Greg Rice Toy Store uh, from 12 years old until I was uh, 16 uh, as a stock boy and uh, shoveled their sidewalks and uh, Basically, uh, had a great childhood, but uh, a quiet childhood in St. Joe, and uh, at five years old was even allowed to, to go to the store, uh, which was a couple blocks, and, and pick up groceries and stuff like that, cause, so I was kind of independent, mm -hmm. yet uh, uh, kind of had a watchful eye on me. Okay. What did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My father was a, uh, an accountant at uh, Auto Specialties, which is... Uh, not too far away from from here, from the, uh, where they were, and uh, my mom was just a housekeeper. And she did uh, other. Uh, she even took in laundry and uh, ironing, and uh, also raised a couple kids. Uh, that uh, their parents, both of their parents, worked. So we we always had uh, uh, people around, and uh, she raised like three other kids uh, besides her own five, and so. Uh, Quite a woman. And then when did you finish high school? 1965, uh, June of 1965. Okay, and what did you do once you got out of high school? Once I got out of high school, I was uh, in uh, July, I got a call from uh, the father of the, the child that we were uh, basically taking care of. And he says, you want a job? And I says, yes. And uh, he was the plant manager at Heath Company. So I went in uh, the next day and uh, applied and uh, started the next day as a, uh, a stock boy in the, uh, uh, the bag line of Heath Company and uh, worked there until I uh, got drafted, basically. Okay. And when did you Which get was, drafted? I got my papers on uh, Christmas Eve of 1965, and I reported for duty on... Uh, 7 5 1966. Okay. Now, at that point, the Vietnam War has begun to, to heat up. Yes. Uh, they've been fighting over there on the ground since uh, spring of 65. Uh, so, how much did you know about Vietnam at that time? Not a whole lot. Uh, you know, the, the course of television had uh, basically had the war on pretty much every day, and I knew it was heating up. And, uh, of course, being kind of raised a pacifist, I was. Uh, Certainly not uh, ready to go in, but uh, uh, when duty calls, you go. Okay. Uh, and uh, where do you report uh, first? Well, the, the first uh, we got, uh, after my, my notice, it said to report to the, uh, the YMCA in Benton Harbor, and uh, there was about 60 or so guys that got on a bus, and uh, the bus went from uh, Benton Harbor to Detroit, where we uh, uh, spent the night and uh, got to see my first strip show, <laughs> you know, being 18. And uh, then... Uh, well, did they do a physical there? They did do a physical there and uh, in inducted us in the, the next day. But uh, interestingly enough, that night, I kind of walked on the Windsor Bridge, which is between Detroit and Canada, mm -hmm. and thought about it, you know. Do you really want to do this? You know, you're going to get drafted. There's a Vietnam War, but uh, you know, uh, good sense prevailed, and I, you know, went and took my oath, and I'm I'm proud and, and glad that I did. Mm -hmm. 
But even as early as the beginning of 66, people were talking about going to Canada rather than yes. going on to Vietnam. There were a lot of conscientious objectors in which I, you know, toyed with the idea of being a conscientious objector, but, uh, you know, considering the alternative and, uh, you know, the, the hoops you have to go through, I, I decided uh, the service is probably the best thing for me. Okay. When you were doing the physical, or what, did there seem to be anybody there trying to kind of work the system or find a way to get out? You know, of it? I, it wasn't apparent to me that there was. Uh, uh, you know, everybody pretty much that that went on the bus. There, I think there might have been two or three that actually went back to to St. Joe and mm -hmm. as a, either four A or or whatever their their uh, their uh, status was, but. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of people that went in with me, you know, and a lot of them from Berrien County. Okay. And uh, indeed, uh, when uh, we went to, uh, from from Detroit, we went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, by train. Okay. So we went from, you know, in Detroit, we boarded a train and then went to St. Louis. And then from St. Louis, we did a caravan to, to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and uh, basically, uh, Processed in, had our shots and uh, everything else. You know, interesting enough when they were given the shots with the you know the old pneumatic air gun, the guy in, in uh, back of me, uh, no, the guy in front of me. You know, as he was given the shot, he says, uh, "You better be able to catch the guy in front of you because he's going to go." And he did. You know, he fainted. But uh, we were there a week in 107 degree uh, temperature. You know, in the middle of July, and then from there. We went to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and interesting enough, we uh, when we got to Fort Campbell, uh, they had never had a basic training uh, there at all, and it was the home of the 101st Airborne, as a lot of people know. But uh, the barracks that we were introduced to were open until from uh, World War II, mm -hmm. so we had to clean the barracks first, paint the barracks first, and uh, you know, do the fire duty and everything else uh, that is required to, to take care of the building. Okay. So you were the first group in there. The very first group, yep. Okay. Did they give you an explanation of why they were moving you around? No, no, not really. Uh, you know, I think they uh, they had so many coming in at the time that, you know, all the other bases that they performed uh, basic training at uh, were, were full. Yeah. So uh, they had to expand it. Because the normal route, if you were coming out of Michigan, you normally went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Right. So Leonard Wood was already kind of a deviation, but that was an established training center, and so they were full, so you go to Fort Campbell. Indeed. Okay. All right. But you have kind of, but the same group of guys from St. Joseph, and you're still with them at this point. Well, uh, not really. Uh, we were with some of them, but uh, when we got to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, a lot of them uh, dispersed okay. uh, elsewhere. So uh, not everybody that uh, we went in with uh, went through basic with us. Okay. Someone went other places. Now, once you get uh, to, to Fort Campbell, so you, you've done some of the preliminaries, you've been issued your clothing, you've had your haircuts and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, now, did you spend most of your time at the beginning trying to get the barracks ready before you did other training? Well, it was about probably five to seven days where we were doing, you know, the the cleanup and, and stuff like that and painting and, and uh, basically, uh, you know, sh spit shining the floor and all that. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of that going on. And of course it was in uh, in July and August at th this point uh, that we're, we're doing that. But, uh, you know, we got the place pretty well uh, shined up and, and uh, then enjoyed it from the rest of the time. Okay. And then what did the actual basic training consist of? Uh, well, they basically it's, it's just like every other the the ten weeks. Uh, you know, you go through the the being gassed and uh, uh, you know I, I recall sitting in uh, in a field uh, being taught and uh, watching some paratroopers come down and seeing one guy go all the way from up there to down there and his parachute didn't open. You know, so that was kind of my first. My goodness, this is not uh, this is not fun a, a lot, you know. And there's there are people that are going to die. But uh, uh, interesting enough that that happened a, a couple times with me, not not just a parachute, but uh, 
being in a situation where you know I saw death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, this, what kind of physical shape were you in? I was a skinny kid, 155 uh, out of out of high school, and uh, I gained a little weight when I. Uh, uh, between high school and what the time I got drafted, I had a little bit of gut on me, but uh, boy, by the time I got out of basic training, I was in the best shape I've ever been. You know, I could, uh, you know, I, I, I looked good, I felt good, and, uh, you know, one of those, uh, when you hit the wall, you know, running, you know, two, three, five, ten miles, you know, uh, it, it got to the point towards the end of it, uh, hey, let's do it again. You know, it was so, you know, a lot of guys, really got in shape and uh, but there were a couple in the the, the unit uh, that kind of did play the system because we had uh, they were running us from five uh, o'clock in the morning until close to ten o'clock at night and we had one guy who had evidently uh, friends in high places and he called uh, some senators or congressmen or whatever and complained about it and they they kind of uh, you know put us in bed by nine o'clock then uh, but uh, you know, it was a, a pretty tough basic training, but, you know, we knew that uh, this was going to save our lives and, you know, we had better pay attention and and uh, the, the training you get in the Army, I'll tell you, they, they do know how to do it and uh, they're, they're masters of it and uh, you, you get an education despite yourself. Okay. How much emphasis was there in discipline? Uh, very. Uh, you know, a lot of our uh, uh, NCOs were uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, we had a, a short little guy by the name of uh, Sergeant Washington that uh, would challenge, you know, the the biggest guys in the in the unit to, uh, you know, do pull ups and sit ups and things like that. And uh, we had one guy, a, a guy by the name of Bob Evans from uh, Benton Harbor, who uh, he could do pull ups that like nobody's business. He had arms on him like this and. Uh, uh, he was the only guy that ever beat uh, good old Sergeant Washington. Okay. Uh, now, how did they deal with people who, who messed up? Well, they uh, they got sent home. You know, the, the, there was probably maybe three to five in the entire basic training that uh, just didn't cut the mustard and, and got sent home. Okay. What about more minor infractions or problems? When did they try? Well, the, you know, the Article 15s and stuff like that. There were there weren't that many of them. You know. Everybody pretty much told the line, but uh, there were there were occasional uh, uh, misconducts that uh, you know were minor, but uh, they they seemed to, to to not be very prevalent. Okay, because like, you hear a lot when you're talking about basic training about people just getting you know disciplined by the sergeants for one thing or another. So you can you know, KP or extra PT or things like that. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Uh, or sometimes punishing a whole company for some guy slipping up or something. Exactly. And how much of that went on? Not a whole lot. Uh, of course, you know, there was uh, the, the dry shaving and, and, and stuff like that that they made the guys do, but uh, in push-ups, you know, of course, give me 20, you know, give me 50, you know, whatever. But uh, not a whole lot of that because everybody pretty much told the line. Okay. And how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to life in the Army? You know, it wasn't that hard because uh, of the discipline. You know, it's uh, you, you knew you had to do it, and uh, you, you got up every morning, uh, had breakfast, and did PT, and, and went through the training. A lot of times, you know, during the training, you're just pooped out, and, you know, you're almost falling asleep, but uh, you do tend to pay attention because uh, you know it's going to be worth it in the, in the long run. Okay. And then how long did that uh, training take? That was like 10 weeks, I think it was. Did that include the initial work on the barracks and stuff, or? No, uh, that was in addition to. Okay. Yeah, so. Okay. So when did you finish, basically? I basically, I finished it around uh, September, middle of September. Okay, and where do you go from there? From there, we went to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama. I was lucky enough when I took the preference test, uh, you know, the testing that they give you in, uh, I think it was in Fort Leonard Wood, mm -hmm. uh, where they sit you down and, and find out your aptitude. Uh, I had grew up with a father that uh, actually built a, a boat in his basement, in, uh, you know, out of plywood, and uh, he uh, actually, after he built it, he couldn't even get the, the boat out of the basement, <laughs> so he had to take out some blocks next to the window so he could slide it out. And uh, But, you know, growing up with, with my father and, and uh, 
he was kind of a uh, an everyman. He he worked on things. Uh, you know, was very, you know. So I got a, a used to to knowing about uh, tools and things like that. And consequently, when uh, the test came out, it it uh, you know it was things mechanical and and uh, you know uh, like that that I had an aptitude for. So they sent me to basic aviation <coughs> school. So uh, from like uh, October to November, I went through uh, basic uh, aircraft maintenance. Then I graduated like seventh in the class there. There was about 35, 40 guys in the class. And uh, then I went to... Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, what did the training itself consist of there? Well, the basic aviation was, you know, it was both fixed wing and uh, how planes fly, uh, you know, lift, drag, uh, uh, torque, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things about engines, radial engines, uh, jet engines, uh, uh, you know, regular uh, aircraft engines, uh, things like that. We worked on uh, uh, just basically light uh, fixed wing helicopters, uh, not the helicopters, but uh, fixed wing aircraft and helicopters. Uh, both, but it was just a, a general aviation, and if you did well there, you, you went out of the next school. So I did well there and went on. And what balance was there between classroom and hands-on work when you were doing that? Uh, classroom was probably 80% uh, and about 20% hands-on. Okay. And then while you were, I mean, was the atmosphere there uh, as intense as it was in, in basic training? Oh, for, for no, not, not at all. Uh, it was, well, we went to uh, Fort Rucker. First of all, we went from a uh, World War II type barracks to a brick, uh, two man, almost like a college atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we, we thought we were going to be doing PT every day, and, and uh, you know, we thought that this was going to be the norm, but uh, indeed it was not. Uh, a lot of times it was, uh, you do a little bit of PT in the morning, and then the rest of it's all academic. So you, uh, took class and then after class you studied and uh, and tried to absorb everything that you learned that day and uh, went on to the next and the next and the next. So it was, it was more like a college atmosphere and uh, you know I had a, a guy, uh, uh, Rich Szymanski, that uh, I roomed with that was pretty smart and uh, we kind of uh, put our heads together and, and, uh, and uh, you know during our off times we played you know, uh, checkers and chess and you know go to uh, the PX and, and buy things and uh, they even had a little uh, area where you know they had instruments so you could you know I was a kind of a frustrated dashboard drummer and I got my first chance to play a set of drums there and you know it, it was it was a good it was a good good school okay. Fort Rucker is a, a nice place okay and where in Alabama is that that's in Dothan Alabama okay. right by uh, near the the uh, uh, Florida border and while I was at the Dolphin Airport here comes Bobby Goldsboro. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you doing here? And he says, I live here. And I says, oh, okay. But he was uh, an old singer back from the 60s. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Uh, country singer. Okay. Uh, and so that was another about eight weeks there? Or five weeks five for that weeks. and then, uh, then I went to the next school which was uh, Light Observation Helicopter which was the uh, OH-1, uh, the Hiller OH-1 uh, uh, light observation helicopter and the Bell helicopter, the one, one with the bubble in front. Mm -hmm. You know, so we did the, the light observation helicopter for five weeks and I got really introduced to, to more in the helicopters and the engines and, and you know, actually uh, doing work on the, the helicopter and taking things apart and doing regular routine maintenance on it and then uh, uh, was that still at Fort Rucker? That was still Fort Rucker. And then uh, after that, was that was also five weeks. And I graduated seventh in the class there. Then after that, uh, I graduated to another school, which was like uh, our utility helicopter. And uh, ironically enough, they changed it, uh, trained us on the CH-34 Choctaw, which was the, the big Bell helicopter, oh, well, Sikorsky helicopter with the the radial engine in front and the, you know, the pilot that sits up way up and, you know, everybody kind of, it's one of the old, you know, Korean helicopters, but uh, that was actually the first helicopter ride that I 
uh, rode in the siege, 34 Choctaw, which was kind of fun. So then, after all these schools, uh, you know, then I went home for, uh, uh, for Christmas. And then when I got uh, back, you know, this is basically in, in January of 1967. Uh, when I got back, I got the orders to go to Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay. Uh, so all of the helicopter training was at Fort Rucker then, so all three schools? All of it. Okay. And then now you're living in sort of southern Alabama at that point, and you're getting off base and so forth. Did you notice kind of a difference in the culture between home and down there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, uh, I had a friend, uh, Terry Sperling, who lived in Atlanta. So I would go home with him. Uh, he had a, a wife, Hope Sperling, that uh, uh, he wanted to go home and see, and, and you know, being the, the southern hospitality, I'll tell you, it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they uh, accepted me, you know, kind of as a, a little brother and stuff like that. And uh, so almost every weekend, uh, I would go home with him, and then uh, she had a, uh, a, a, a cousin that I dated, you know, so I, you know, we were, we were, Weekends we would go up to Atlanta and you know, so I go back and forth and really didn't uh, ply myself uh, in the uh, The base area, mm -hmm. you know, I was I basically got away from there of course I you know being short hair and everything else everybody knows mm -hmm. Hey, he's army, you know stay away from him. the locals, you know, just didn't really care for for uh, military uh, usually but uh, at least that's what, that's what we thought. Okay. And did you notice sort of the, the racial divide down there, or was that not really? No, not thought? really. Uh, I didn't see it at all. We had uh, uh, black, white, uh, uh, Mexican, uh, Puerto Rican, uh, you know, uh, uh, all different. And, you know, uh, of course, uh, s some being from California and some being from Tennessee. Occasionally, you know, my, my state's bigger than your state, you know, but uh, there really wasn't any uh, animosity or anything else or, or any racial uh, things because, you know, we, we knew we were going to, you know, eventually probably wind up in Vietnam and you have to count on these guys. Uh, I was also asking about just the community and off the base because that's a little bit of a different world from up here. Yeah. But off the base, you know, I really didn't spend a whole lot of time. I never went, even went to Florida. You know, all the time I was in Alabama, I was maybe, I think, 60 miles away from Florida, but I was always going north up to Atlanta, so uh, uh, I never got to Florida until probably 30 years later. Okay. All right. So you finished all that, you've gone home, and now you get sent out to Fort Carson, Colorado. Right. What was going on there? In Fort Carson, Colorado, we were the, uh, when I got uh, my notice to a report, it was uh, to the 92nd, and the 92nd was... Uh, reactivated in Fort Carson, Fort Carson, Colorado on February 1st, 1967. So when I got there in the uh, first part of February, there were six or seven guys in the entire company. Mm -hmm. The company clerk, a company commander, and a, a couple other guys. And, uh, you know, we're kind of thinking, okay, you know, what, what's going on? So life for probably a month or so was uh, just people coming in and getting settled and and uh, not really any duties or anything else other than keeping the barracks clean and you know spit shining your shoes and things like that but uh, uh, basically we were uh, building up as a unit uh, from that point on okay uh, now at what point do you have enough people in there to actually start training or working with helicopters or anything like that well probably in in March or so of the uh, of that uh, year, we, we actually had a uh, probably 150 or so guys that uh, we started uh, uh, training together. And then uh, in uh, June of that year, we got all brand new helicopters, so UH-1H models, which had the Lycoming L-53, uh, higher horsepower, uh, more torque and everything else. Uh, helicopters, UH-1 Iroquois, uh, and they basically uh, uh, had an air fort, you know, it was a, a huge uh, uh, hangar that they had all the helicopters in, and uh, uh, most of our training 
well, from that point on was, uh, you know, taking apart the helicopter, putting it back together and doing test flights and all that. And, of course, training the pilots, too. Because, uh, you know, you got brand new pilots that just got out of Fort Rucker. That's where they trained the pilots also. And uh, so when you went on uh, uh, flights with them, it was kind of a little scary because they were kind of new, too. So Were the pilots at this point officers or warrant officers or what were they? Both. They were, we had both warrants and... Uh, uh, captains, lieutenants, and uh, even majors, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. And had you done work on older models of Hueys at Fort Rucker, and this is a new thing? Not at no, all. We, we never touched, we never even saw a Huey at okay. Fort Rucker. So, you know, it was, okay, here's all your training, okay, now you got a, a completely different animal, and uh, now uh, this is what you're going to be training on. But they actually had people from uh, Bell there to train us, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people that actually made the helicopter. And uh, at that time, they were only $250,000 a pop. You know, but basically, uh, being a crew chief, you're assigned that helicopter. Mm -hmm. So they, that's under your, you know, your, uh, your care all that time. It's 6616502 uh, was my tail number, and uh, I had that all the way through Vietnam, and uh, uh, good aircraft, good mm -hmm. aircraft. Okay, so you actually, now did you get the aircraft you got assigned in Colorado, would you, did you take those to Vietnam eventually? Yes. Okay, so you actually had the same machine. Exactly, the same exact that machine. Sort of when now, we got it, there was I think six hours on it, it's flying from wherever they, they were made to, to uh, Colorado, and then uh, from, uh, from the, the point on we learned how to make out the maintenance books and everything else. And uh, interesting enough, and at the the 25 hour, uh, you do a uh, a routine. Uh, 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 what do they call it? Quarterly, and uh, basically the the helic the helicopter and the crew chief always are together. You know, no matter what the pilot uh, who who flies it, the the crew chief always goes with that helicopter. So uh, during the test flight, after 25 hours. You know, we're, we're flying around, uh, and uh, we get the call. Uh, uh, we have a report of smoke in the uh, area, and uh, we want you to go investigate. So we flew over to where we saw the smoke, and uh, a helicopter had uh, hit a high-tension wire, mm -hmm. crashed, and killed everybody on board, all four people. They were actually chasing a deer. and. Uh, hit a high tension wire and uh, crashed and you know so we landed and you know I'm walking over here and this is the first time I've seen body parts you know and this is just in training mm -hmm. so uh, uh, you know we've reported okay no survivors and there were none and you know that's the first time I smelled the magnesium and, and you know had all the senses of you know this is what death in a helicopter is like and uh, it was it was not fun now, what was a normal crew complement in one of these helicopters? Uh, crew chief, who was also a gunner, mm -hmm. a gunner, who uh, basically took care of the armaments, uh, pilot and co-pilot. Okay. That was it. Four. All right. And how many men could have one of those carry? Uh, Eleven soldiers, uh, up to sixteen or eighteen, sometimes twenty Vietnamese, because mm -hmm. they were so, so much smaller than us. Smaller and not carrying as much pack most of the Indeed. Time. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. So when you're at Fort Carson, do you do any training eventually with combat troops? I mean, there were... We, we had, uh, yes, we did. We uh, uh, had uh, uh, insertions that we practiced. We had uh, extractions that we practiced. Uh, we had uh, just basically flight training, you know, and uh, flying around the area. Uh, that we practiced. Uh, uh, I remember one time we, we were doing an insertion and, uh, you know, of course, Colorado, there was, it was pretty hilly, and uh, we were sitting, you know, kind of hovering in an area, and we actually had uh, jets also, you know, uh, supporting us. And we had a uh, F4C uh, uh, Phantom come around and miss us, you know, he came around the, the backside of a hill and missed us by maybe a, 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 a rotor length, mm -hmm. 
you know, and he, he got balled out by it. He, he wasn't really supposed to be that low. But, uh, you know, so we, we actually had some close calls in uh, Colorado also. And we also had other helicopters when they, uh, they practiced what they call gyroscopic precession. When they uh, uh, have an engine failure and the helicopter will drop like a rock and then you pull in collective and it'll softly land. Well, occasionally somebody won't pull it up soon enough and it'll completely uh, spread out the, the, uh, the, uh, the landing gear to, to pretty much flat. We had that happen occasionally, probably twice, I think. So, All right. had a few accidents during training but, uh, and a couple deaths during training, but other than that, uh, it went pretty smoothly. Did you have any trainers or officers in your unit who had already flown helicopters in Vietnam? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, Major Goodspeed and uh, uh, Captain Meyer, or Major uh, Meyer, uh, our company commander, uh, we probably had maybe 30 or 40 guys that this, they were going back for their second tour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had, uh, especially Major Goodspeed, he pulled up his shirt and he says, you see this? You know, bullet holes. You know, scars, you know, this is, this is what you're in for, you know, so, so take this training seriously, and uh, we did, we did. Okay, uh, now at what point then do you actually deploy to Vietnam? Uh, we deployed, uh, well, okay, uh, basically we, in Colorado, and we had to go from Colorado to Stockton, California, mm -hmm. to fly, uh, you know, from, uh, from Colorado to Stockton. We flew down to, uh, uh, let's see, it was Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then we went to uh, Arizona, a small little base in Arizona getting refueled. I flew across the Painted Desert and, st and stuff like that. It was kind of a, you know, because we were flying maybe 500 to 1,000 feet. And uh, uh, flew from all the way from Colorado to California. I went to Las Vegas, flew down the the middle of lost uh, of the strip in, in formation, all uh, 26 helicopters of ours uh, when we first landed. And of course, uh, everybody spent the night all, you know, everybody was up all night uh, in Vegas. But, uh, and then flew into to Stockton, California, where uh, they were cocooned and, and taken apart by other people while we were on leave. We, we went to leave, uh, 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 basically before we went over to Vietnam. And then I got a call while I was on leave saying, come back early, we're going early. Okay. So uh, they kind of cut our, our, uh, our leave short. And then when we got back, we uh, uh, finished cocooning the helicopters. Uh, of course, this was near uh, San Francisco. So, and uh, it seems like in the Army, everybody hitchhiked everywhere. You know, in, in Colorado, we hitchhiked all the way up to the Vail and uh, Golden, Colorado, uh, Denver from Colorado Springs, where uh, Fort Carson was. And uh, so uh, a lot of times, uh, me and a, a fr friend of mine from Y, uh, Mike Christensen, we would uh, uh, hitchhike into to, uh, San Francisco. And we were there on uh, Halloween. If you're ever there in Halloween in San Francisco in the 60s, it was quite a quite a, quite a scene, <laughs> you know. Hippies everywhere, of course. I hate Ashbury, you know, all that all that going on. And uh, why we're there, I think uh, the the Grateful Dead were playing at the Fillmore West, and uh, I think during that time John Lennon actually was at Golden Gate Park uh, doing an impromptu little concert that uh, people just kind of gathered around. But uh, we were walking along the street, and uh, all of a sudden we got the uh, hey, come on in. Have a glass of champagne, and it was a an artist uh, studio that uh, had a grand opening, mm -hmm. you know. So we, we kind of uh, enjoyed that and and, uh, and saw all different kinds of things in San Francisco before we uh, uh, went over to Vietnam. And then uh, oh, when, when they, they got that, were you in uniform or out of uniform? oh no no never in uniform no. Did no. they look at your haircut and know who you were? Kind of, sort of. We you know we try to let it grow long. You know it wasn't. Uh, as much uh, discipline as, as far as, you know, you got to have a butch haircut and everything else. So, you know, I had a, a, a little bit of a hair, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of figured we were Army or, or so, but uh, we tried not to be, you know, it was the old white Levi's and, 
and uh, button-down T-shirt or, or shirts days. So uh, we try to look as as uh, common as, as normal. Okay. All right. So you have that experience, uh, and then what happens? And then we uh, we uh, put all the helicopters on the Kula Gulf, which was a old World War II uh, uh, merchant marine. Uh, aircraft carrier with wooden decks uh, similar to the USS Wasp you know in, in size and stuff but it was a, actually a merchant marine and uh, from there uh, a friend of mine uh, Mike Christensen and I we built a kite on the and we flew the kite from California all the way over to Vietnam this one kite that we built mm -hmm. actually flew the entire length of the Pacific Ocean uh, we never stopped. It was like 17 or 19 days uh, from from coast to coast. But uh, during that time, I did. Uh, you know, everybody had a duty there. Some some people had light duty. Some people had uh, tough duty. My my duty was uh, uh, KP and the, the salad chef, who was a uh, a uh, Filipino, which is just a sweet guy who was uh, 66 and he was expecting his first child. So he was he was kind of excited and and uh, you know it was it was a nice. Nice trip. Got to read a lot of uh, books on the way over there. You know, there was no uh, other than you know, other you know, little KP duties or something like that. It was kind of like a, a cruise. Yeah. You know, what was the weather like on the trip over? Weather we uh, we skirted a, uh, a hurricane, or well, I typhoon. guess it would be a yeah. a typhoon over there. But uh, we skirted one of those, and and we had one guy who literally from. Point A to point B was uh, hanging over the deck. He was sick the entire time. But uh, you know, the ocean—it it never bothered me. And you never see a bluer ocean than the middle of Pacific. And <laughs> excuse me, in the skies, just just amazing. The the, the and stars what, and everything else. And what kind of accommodations did you have on the ship? <clears throat> uh, similar to you know, good old World War II uh, aircraft carriers. You know, bunks that were. Uh, three tiered, and uh, you know you you only had about a, a foot or two between each each bunk, but uh, not you know you were very you were there to sleep and that was it. Uh, otherwise, you were elsewhere on the boat, either the front or the back or the top, and you know just just relaxing. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, when do you actually arrive in Vietnam? We uh, sailed into Vung Tau uh, about the middle of uh, November. And then uh, uncocooned our air, Vung Tau is kind of the R and R center of Vietnam yeah. for for in country, but uh, we uh, we uncocooned our aircraft, got them all already, did a, a pre flight check, and then flew from from there to to Vung Tau, and then from Vung Tau we uh, flew up the, the coast to uh, Don Batin, stopping in I think Play Cool and a couple other places to to refuel, and then. Once we got to uh, um, uh, Dong Batin, which was uh, the headquarters for the uh, 10th Aviation Battalion, uh, we were the only uh, helicopter unit there. Uh, so uh, they had the revetments and everything else built. They had the uh, the, the hooches built, and uh, uh, the only thing we had to do, probably for the first uh, week or so, was fill sandbags and build our our bunkers and, and things like that, and, and then uh, uh, at Don Batin we had three quarters of the perimeter was uh, guarded by the North Korean, uh, North Korean, South Koreans, which were crazy. I mean, these guys would beat each other up just for fun, and one quarter of it was uh, the U.S. that we took care of. So, okay. so men from your own unit had guard the perimeter duty. Correct. Okay. Uh, so, and then this is close to. This is close to uh, Cameron Bay. It's right across the, the. Actually, there was a little river that went in between there, but it, right up, right by Cameron Bay. So, okay, uh, and a safe area, pretty safe. Okay, and, and so what was your kind of initial impression of Vietnam when you got there? You know, uh, the the people. You know, I kind of felt sorry for them. Uh, uh, being a, you know, it was a third world country. Never seen that. You know, growing up. You know, in a. A pretty sheltered Midwest life, uh, seeing uh, poverty and and you know seeing people squat and go to the bathroom right in the middle of the road and uh, you know it was uh, it was a, a rude awakening to 
you know, there are other people in the, the world that aren't as well off as you. So I, I felt a, a compassion for him. And, uh, and uh, of course, we had uh, hooch maze and things like that uh, that we interfaced with. And, uh, you know, I thought they were really decent people and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of enjoyed them. Okay. Uh, did you have a lot of Vietnamese working on your base? We had probably a dozen, two dozen. You know, they would uh, take care of our burning our crap, you know, and, and cleaning the hooches and sweeping, you know, stuff that we normally would do, but uh, uh, that was farmed out, and uh, they did our laundry and then uh, uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, there was, we had probably, I think there were two uh, hooch maids for each, each hooch, and we had uh, close to eight or ten hooches, so. Okay. So how many men total in your company, do you think? Uh, 200 and some, um, I see, I got, I got a, when we went over there, there were 62 officers and 156 enlisted men. Mm -hmm. and we had the uh, 617th uh, technical detachment, who had one officer and 66 enlisted men, and then we had the 732nd signal detachment, had one officer and six enlisted men, and uh, when we got over there, a lot of that was dispersed, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, of the 16 high-ranking officers, 10 went elsewhere and became company commanders at different places and, you know, so we, you know, going over as a unit, which was rare during the Vietnam era, you know, normally you go, you go over there one at a time, uh, going over there as a unit, having that camaraderie, first of all, training as a unit, and then uh, kind of losing some of this, the, the high end, you know, it really didn't bother us, but most of the the officer, uh, the enlisted men and warrant officers and stuff like that stayed with the unit. Okay. Uh, so now, how quickly do you start flying once you're there? We start flying, uh, well, we yeah, fly yeah. to the base yeah. and then uh, a week after uh, that, uh, it was uh, uh, Thanksgiving. We had a, our first Thanksgiving there. And uh, actually our first flight, uh, I was the command ship and they, they had another uh, uh, ship that, that flew up there too, and there were two gunships that, uh, uh, our very first mission was on December 7th, uh, 1967, or six, yeah, 67, and uh, uh, as it, it was at dusk, and basically they were gonna fly around the perimeter and, and uh, you know, basically test their instruments and, and uh, and shoot up, you know, whatever. Just uh, it was called dust patrol, dusk patrol. And then uh, uh, as we were, you know, I was kind of making a, a the the crew chief always sits on the the uh, left hand side of the, the helicopter. So we we were coming around like this, and all of a sudden I heard my gunner say, "Did I just see what happened?" And the pilot had flown into the ground killing everybody. So the very before we even had a mission, mm -hmm. we lost four guys on December 7th. And was that the 1967. other? 67. Was that the other? That was a gunship. That was one of the gunships. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There were two gunships and two Hueys that were flying around. So, uh, and I, interesting enough, uh, Rich Platt, the, the crew chief on the uh, gunship that had passed away, uh, him and I were in the, uh, the briefing room and I had just bought a record player and he had just bought a Frank Sinatra album. So we were sitting there listening to the Frank Sinatra album. And uh, this guy, Rich Pratt, uh, he was the only guy I've ever seen that could, could do a fingertip push-up. He could put his hands out like this, press his fingers, and an entire body would levitate off the ground. He, he was an amazing guy. He was a smoke jumper from uh, uh, Onondaga, Washington or something like that. He uh, actually put out fires, you know, he was a firefighter. Uh, but just, you know, one of the, the, the greatest guys and, uh, you know, to see, he actually lived past midnight, so he actually died on uh, December 8th. But uh, uh, that was our first casualties, and this was before we even had a mission. And did they ever figure out why that happened? It was just... it, they called it pilot error, you know, in, in Major Goodspeed, the, the guy that flew into the ground, he, you know, they, they looked through, uh, uh, infrared or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. scopes to, to sight the, uh, the target and uh, he evidently uh, just had an error and, and uh, 
hit a tree and, and tumbled in and exploded. And uh, the, the, the entire rest of the night, I was up, uh, you know, so when we figured that out, you know, we had to send a, uh, a contingent out there to, to secure the area. Mm -hmm. So uh, during that time, I would uh, go back to the base. I would load up with, uh, uh, what do they call them? Lanterns, you know, the float down. What do they call those? Like parachute flares or? Yeah, flares, yeah. flares. Yeah. And so for the, the entire rest of the night, that's what I was doing. I, you know, I pick up like 20 or 30 flares and then we fly around and, and drop them off so we could light the way for the, the guys that were going there to secure the perimeter. Right. But uh, uh, some guys swear that they saw fire coming up from uh, the area, you know, bullets and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it was uh, officially stated as a, a pilot error and uh, that's what it was. So. At that point, you know, on December 7th, uh, you know, in getting there in just in November in, in Thanksgiving and, you know, you figure this is, uh, this isn't going to be easy. Yeah. How did you wind up as the crew chief on the command helicopter? I, you know, it was just the luck of the draw. You know, I was just, uh, I was surprised, you know, I was, I was, I was proud, you know, that I was picked as uh, uh, that, that particular uh, 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 time to, to, to be the command helicopter, but you know it, we never had the same pilots. We we always kind of we had kind of the the same pilots sometimes, but uh, all the pilots that you know they would just assign an aircraft and uh, that's what you do. And would the company commander fly with you essentially in the co-pilot seat, or would he not always fly with you? No, he was he was actually okay. flown the pilot seat. So okay, because you were saying that the pilots changed or rotated. Would that be the other pilot? I mean, would you normally be with the company commander then? No, no, oh. you you would be with different pilots every time you went up. It was just whoever happened to be commanding that particular mission. No, this was the company commander. Okay, I guess. But I was asking you, did the company commander consistently fly with you? No, no. All no. right, just that time he did. Okay. He he pretty much didn't fly. Okay. You know, he but he was up there because you know this was the first mission, and, and well, it wasn't a mission; it was just a uh, a practice. Right. But uh, you know, he he went up there because he wanted to to be up there. You know, so. Okay. Uh, so I guess I was trying to ask, what does it mean to be in a command helicopter? I mean, not not anything really different, other than you know he has control of the situation. He he gives the orders. So, so you're flying with whoever is commanding that mission. Correct. Okay. There you go. Now, at what point do you start doing actual combat missions? Uh, you know, ironically enough, uh, the unit uh, that we were in, the, the missions that we had were uh, really kind of like, uh, almost like taxi missions. You know, we, we supported, okay, here, let's see what we got. We just supported the, uh, the DSA, the Deputy Senior Advisor, Two Corps Area, the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, MACV, mm -hmm. uh, the Army and the Republic of Vietnam, the Republic of Korea, ROC units, we supported them, uh, Special Forces units, uh, the MACV Recondo School at Nha Trang, which was uh, what they call LERPs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Long Range uh, Night Patrol. Reconnaissance Patrol, yeah. Exactly. And, uh, we did a lot of that and uh, combat support of the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and the 4th Infantry Division. So we performed missions throughout the entire two core area, but, uh, and including Cambodia and, you know, areas where, you know, if you get shot down, you know, we have to disavow you ever being there, you know. So it was, uh, a jigsaw puzzle of, of you know flatlands, uh, mountains. Uh, you know there were areas uh, like the lot that was a French uh, artist village that was just just beautiful up in the mountains at like ten thousand feet or so. And uh, but a lot of times you were doing single ship missions, and uh, only occasionally would you doing uh, combat insertions and, and stuff like that. And okay. uh, not everybody in the entire unit would do uh, the entire combat. Uh, insertion, uh, you know. Sometimes, you know, I'd be sitting there, and and the guys would come back, and you know, oh, you should have seen what happened, you know. And but uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, I probably did maybe six or eight uh, actual insertions, of which one or two might have been hot. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so a lot of the time, are you just moving personnel around? Yes. Or just, you know, just from base to base, that kind of thing? Or base or to base. Supplies, and, or? Yes. In you know, small villages, you know, dropping in a, a MACV commander or something like that, and he'll do an assessment of uh, the area and, and find out what's going on in the area and, and uh, uh, a lot of that. Uh, did you have any particularly interesting or distinctive missions before the start of the Tet Offensive at the end of January? Yeah, uh, before that, uh, being H models, we had, uh, you know, the, a lot of horsepower. And uh, I remember flying, uh, I think it was around Play Coup. We were on a mission and uh, we got a call that uh, uh, some uh, Vietnamese had been hit. And uh, they couldn't hover for the, you know, a long time, you know, we had to hover probably about a half an hour while they extracted people up a rope. Uh, but uh, going into that, uh, uh, you know, we, we said we, we'd help out the, the H model, so we flew into there. And uh, as we flew in, uh, uh, F4C Phantoms were coming on each side of us. Uh, then the gunships, and then we sat there and hovered for, you know, while uh, I think it was close to 10 guys got hauled up and into the aircraft that were all shot up. And, but they were all already bandaged. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that was kind of my scariest moment, you know. Now, was this in kind of a forested area? Oh, yeah. So yeah, we, we were crater. probably 30 feet up or so, and uh, we had to, to hover for close to a half an hour and uh, hovering, you know, of course, raises uh, the temperature and everything else. It's not very good for helicopters, but an H model, they could, they could and take just it. physically, I mean, how do, you, how do you get people up from the ground then? You're hovering, you drop, is there some, a basket or a harness? Yeah, we, we had, down? yeah, we had a winch and, and a harness and, and we took them up like that. Okay. And then did you operate that machinery or did they yes. kind of do that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, how long does it take to pull somebody up if it's that? Probably three, four minutes. So, mm -hmm. and did you take any fire while you were doing that, or was it no? You know, uh, my my gunner said we were taking fire, but I think it was my tracers that were going mm -hmm. toward you know that he saw. Uh, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, I, I never took a shot in in Vietnam, and I had a mother that prayed for me, and I think that's why. You know, I I mean, she said what they what they say is a soldier's prayer. Uh, every time she would think of me, she would say this soldier's prayer, and it was quite often. And it was uh, uh, a prayer to the Virgin Mary, and it was, uh, uh, let's see, how did it go? Uh, Look down upon my soldier's son, take care of him for me. Give comfort to his lonely heart as mine, his mother's plea. Uh, and when his blue and sick at heart, discouraged and pressed, give him the will to carry on and heavenly grace to rest. Show unto him a mother's love is out as shown to me. Give comfort to his lonely heart is mine, his mother's plea. So she would say that. She got the, given that uh, little prayer by a guy by the name of uh, Boyce O'Hare, his mother. He used to call me a little white mouse. I was a towhead as a kid. And uh, she says, you, you say this prayer for your son every time. And uh, that's kind of the reason I came home unscathed, I think. Now, what was life like uh, on the base uh, before the end of January? Life was pretty good. You know, we had, uh, you know, other than, uh, you know, at the base it was pretty good. We had uh, uh, 24 uh, open bay rooms. We had latrines. We had showers, a hot shower. We had uh, uh, bunkers that we built. Uh, we had a ways of, of heating the water so we could have hot showers. Uh, we had a 300-gallon tank on, t on top of a, a little small tower. Uh, in in Cameron, you know, occasionally you could go to Cameron Bay, you could get lobster and, and a hamburger, you know, which was kind of unheard of. But uh, so it, it wasn't that bad, uh, you know. Actually, at the uh, at the base, you know, when, when you weren't working, right. you know, and you were working probably five out of seven days, okay. you know, doing and then something. How, and on a day when you, I mean, how much time did you actually spend in the air? Sometimes, uh, 
five, six hours. You know, it depends on where you're going and what you were doing. Uh, but, uh, you know, you were, you were up there quite a bit. I used to love flying. I mean, just flying along a, a treetop level or, you know, maybe that far off the South China Sea. You know, I just loved it. Just loved it. You know, of course, uh, you know, flying from California to, uh, or from Colorado to California, the, 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 uh, all the crew chiefs got to fly the helicopters. You know, so uh, actually from like Albuquerque to, uh, to, to Vegas, you know, we, we got a little bit of sick time. So we, you know, if anything did happen to, to anybody, which it did happen, you know, a couple officers did get shot and, and uh, you know, you pull the pins, you pull the seat back and uh, you take care of the officers. That's a, the, the uh, co-pilot uh, flies off, but uh, uh, the training and everything else that we, we got back then was uh, pretty good. Okay. Now at the end of January, the Tet Offensive starts, and their attacks made all around Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience at that time? My experience, we went to bed on January 30th, and uh, about uh, 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up to uh, uh, my gunner, who is Rocco Antonio Giuseppe Colucci, was one of the uh, most decorated uh, 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 Long Island uh, police officers after his service, uh, but he he said, we're getting mortared, we're getting mortared, get the hell out of here. So we, we got out of there and uh, went to the bunker. And uh, as we were sitting there, we saw explosions in our uh, revetments of uh, the helicopters. And they had, uh, two sappers had snuck through the Korean perimeter who fell asleep. And two guys came in and had satchel chargers and blew up uh, three of our helicopters. I think they had a couple other ones, but they, they didn't go off. Uh, during this time, mine was in the, the maintenance uh, area, so it was uh, pretty much safe, and they, you know, it was all apart anyway, so they didn't care. But uh, about uh, three o'clock, okay, you know, we were all called together, and uh, you know, when things calmed down, of course, we, we saw, you know, a, a mortar go over our heads to uh, Cameron Bay and hit the the uh, fuel compound or. I think it was a fuel fuel dump, mm -hmm. and uh, that the, that explosion was pretty uh, spectacular. So uh, during that time, we got organized and uh, we set up a, a grid throughout the entire base to where you know everybody could see one another. You know, from here to a couple, you know, maybe a block away, you could see the other guy. And mm -hmm. we set up a grid and we uh, you know uh, uh, swept the entire area to make sure that you know this wasn't happening and. Uh, uh, later, we found out that the, they had snuck through the Korean perimeter, and uh, during that time, uh, the uh, uh, the guys that uh, fell asleep were put in a, uh, a container for like a week, no windows, you know, one of these uh, metal containers, and and uh, I think uh, one of them got a summary execution, you know, and uh, we, of course we. Uh, We didn't want that to happen, but uh, it did happen. But the, the Koreans took all of the stuff there, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Now, did the sappers get back off the base, or? Yes, they got back, went right back through where they where they came. So the explosion didn't happen until they were in and out. Okay. So you know, we thought we were getting mortared, but uh, of course we weren't. It was satchel charges. Mm -hmm. We lost entirely uh, three aircraft. All right, uh, and. Then what happens after that? You... After that, uh, you know, I, uh, my, of course, my helicopter's in maintenance, and then I, uh, I get called up, uh, you know, about 9 o'clock, it says, uh, okay, hi, and you're going on a, a mission. I says, oh, but my helicopter's all tore apart. And he says, not anymore. <laughs> they had put it together from, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning till, till 9 and put it all back together and, uh, and I, they said uh, you're flying with the two corps commander and he's going to do a damage assessment of every village that was hit. So uh, from uh, February 1st, uh, from that point on, we flew to every base. We flew all the way up to the DMZ. We spent the night in, uh, in Way, uh, 
we hit uh, Kason. While we were in Kason, we could see C-130s coming in and taking uh, fire from from the Viet uh, Cong, and uh, you know, so it was an exciting time, but uh, a scary time. And uh, uh, you know, ironically, when we got it to Way, you know, they uh, they said it was overrun, but we were right in the middle of the city, in a in a in a small area with a you know nice house and we were we were fine that night we didn't hear a whole lot of gunfire or anything else but uh, how long after the start of the offensive was that that you got there it was a, like the day after okay. that we were up there but, well we actually had to fly up there so it took quite a while to get up there so we we hit a, a couple little bases on the way up there but every base that was hit we we were at then we flew all the way down to Kanto, including Saigon and Pleiku and Balak and you know all these different areas that uh, were hit. We took a damage assessment, and uh, the furthest south we got was was Kanto, which is in the Mekong Delta, and then we uh, spent a, a couple nights in Saigon also. So, okay. so how long did this whole mission? Probably a week to ten days. Okay, and who was the corps commander? You know, I can't think of his name right now, but. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, one of our lest we forget guys says he was a actually a uh, a civilian, and he says it was one of the the only civilian two corps commanders in Vietnam. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I thought he was military. Well, and, a corps commander would by definition be military. I would think so. Uh, but he might have been some high ranking official. He might have been the top MACV guy in two corps or something. Could like that. could have been. Could have been. Okay. Uh, what impression did you have of him? You know, I, I didn't really have an impression either here nor there. You know, my, my duty was to keep that helicopter going and, uh, and to keep the weapons clean and, and stuff like that. So uh, we concentrated more on uh, the helicopter than the, the, the mission. Okay. As a crew chief, do you, do you have headphones? Can you hear the conversations yes. going on? Yep. So you, at least there's, there's that much that you're aware yes. of. Yes. Yep. You hear everything. Uh, you know, you can talk, you know, but uh, pretty much you're quiet most of the time. You know, that's the officers talk and you you listen. All right. Uh, now, I guess when you went in, into Saigon at that point, uh, what did the situation there seem to be? Situation there, uh, we were in a big hotel, you know, and uh, we didn't see a whole lot of uh, action while we were there, but uh, we could hear gunfire going off in, in the distance, but uh, uh, we were pretty lucky and, and uh, didn't have that problem. All right. Let's tape this about up, so we're going to pause right now. Okay, we were talking a little bit about your experiences at the time of the Tet Offensive. Uh, were there places you went to where you saw sort of serious damage done? Yeah, uh, basically uh, we saw some flying over way. Uh, of course we, you know, took mortar fire and things like that. It, uh, uh, What's the name of the place? Uh, you go to Kaysan? Kaysan. Yeah. Kaysan. That was probably our, our hairiest moment in Kaysan. Uh, the rest of the time it was pretty much after the fact and, uh, and things were pretty normal. But uh, uh, by the time we got to Saigon, it, would, it had settled down a little bit and we were you know, in a, a pretty secure area, so uh, uh, we were pretty safe. You know, when you went into, into Kaysan, how long did you stay there? Uh, just uh, probably two, three hours. Okay. And you were able to leave the helicopter there and it didn't get blown? Yeah. Because yep. Okay. Yep. I guess that they were still taking, so this is probably fairly early in the siege or that part of the fight, that they can still fly yes. in the C 130s. Because there's a point where yeah, they can't we, do we that didn't anymore. actually land at the, on the, uh, the airstrip. Mm -hmm. we, we landed in an area uh, probably. 50 to 100 feet away from the airstrip in a little helicopter landing. Right, right. So we, we were, you know, one helicopter and the, the, all the rest of the aircraft were, mm -hmm. were near the airstrip. So, so you, you were less of a target at that point. Correct. That, that, that Correct. Of them. Uh, and I don't know, and when you were there at, at Quezon, did you just go sit in a bunker the whole time? or did you? No, we, we, we actually sat on the helicopter and watched uh, the action. You know, it was like watching a movie. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, here comes a C-130 in, you know, you see tracers going by and, and everything else, and then you see them drop, 
slip off the load and take right off again. You know, that's kind of what they did. They were in and out in a, a lickety split. But uh, that was probably the most exciting and, and scary uh, uh, time, you know, for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, once you've completed that set of missions, so what do you do next? Well, uh, okay, in the, uh, we, we had a um, mission called Klamath Falls, and uh, it was a unit that we uh, supported uh, uh, at Bowlock, the 170, no, 101st Airborne. Well, the, there's a, yeah, with the 101st Airborne Division, uh, and then also the 173rd Airborne Brigade, which is a separate unit that was in the Highlands. Right. So we, uh, first week of January, primary mission was the operation of uh, Operation Klamath Falls. Mm -hmm. We manned a forward base at Bowlock. So a lot of our, uh, not everybody, but uh, a substantial majority uh, went to Bowlock. And uh, during that time, uh, we caravan from Dong Batin, you know, up the mountains and everything else by truck mm -hmm. uh, to take our supplies to Balak. So uh, I was involved in that uh, as a driver, truck driver, you know, going through the uh, entire country of, of Vietnam in, in a uh, two and a half ton, uh, deuce and a half truck. So uh, w once we got there, we set up base and, and supported them, and, and people were, you know, helicopters were in and out depending on, uh, uh, you know, what their mission was. But a lot of the, probably two-thirds of our helicopters were, were there uh, strictly to support them, and they were there kind of permanently. And, and I was one of the lucky ones that wasn't. You know, I still went home to Dong Batin and, and, uh, and got to, to sleep in my hooch at night. And when you were caravanning up there, did you have security or protection? We, we had uh, gunships following us along and uh, in Huey's, uh, you know, the, when there weren't gunships, when they, uh, they were constantly with us uh, uh, up and down. And, and uh, some of those roads along the mountains are, are pretty thin and uh, a, a little bit scary. But uh, we went up there, uh, you know, un, unshot and uh, you know, unattacked. And, and uh, uh, once we got to Bowlock, it was really muddy and rainy. Of course, we're... We're starting to end, uh, to begin the uh, the monsoon season, and uh, yeah, good time to uh, that's not a whole lot of yeah. fun, you know. Uh, I remember being a picky eater as a kid, and, and they give you these metal trays, you know, that had little compartments in them, and I remember trying to eat the food as fast as I could before it washed over the edges. You know, it was uh, it was not a whole lot of fun, but uh, you know, you make do. Now, where was this base relative to some of the? More famous places in Tukor, like like Pleiku or things like that. Balak. Yeah, you know it. It was it, we set it up itself. It was kind of in uh, almost like a in a little hilly area, mm -hmm. and uh, we set it up from from scratch. Basically, well, there were people there originally, but uh, uh, when we brought our helicopters in, we didn't have revetments or anything else. We just sat them out in, in the middle of the in the open, and then set up a perimeter, and and you know we pulled guard duty and stuff like that. So, okay. uh, all right. So that was that was stuff that you were doing in early January. Then was that? Yeah. Said? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. before Tet Offensive. So you've done that, uh, but then so part of your unit now is going to be based out there, but you're still back uh, at your original base most Correct. of the time. Correct. Okay. And then from there, so that's when you get attacked, and you go and you fly with a commander around to do the damage assessment. Correct. Okay. And then what comes next? Uh, in, uh, let's see. Because after the Tet Offensive, we came, we get pretty busy. We flew missions from Don Batin to Fantiet, southwest of Balak, north to Quinyan, northwest of Chio Rio. Uh, we did every imaginable type of mission. We were... Uh, Gun support for the deputy advisor, uh, the Twin Duke province in the besieged city of Dalat. We did a lot of things in Dalat. While uh, while I was sitting in Dalat during the Tet Offensive, when we were doing the coming back from uh, up north, mm -hmm. we we hit Dalat, and uh, my buddy uh, Dick Balsmo was on a gunship. Uh, we were sitting at the airport, which had a corrugated uh, uh, runway, and we were sitting there at the airport, probably. Oh, half a mile away, you could see uh, gunships 
flying over this area, and you can see tracers coming up from this one area. And um, he got the order, he says, okay, lower both miniguns and strafe the area. And uh, they did, and uh, after that, uh, he says, uh, we got a problem. Uh, they shot out our tail rotor. So, you know, in the helicopters, what they call gyroscopic precession, the rotor goes around like this, and if, if they don't, they, the tail goes the other way. So if, when you don't have a tail rotor, you have to land at like 60 knots or above and, uh, in order to land, you know, otherwise you crash and burn. And uh, uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm seeing this tracers come up and then all of a sudden they hear this over the radio, okay, okay we gotta come in for a, a, a 60 knot landing. And I don't know if you've ever seen these, these runways that they, they had there. What, what did they used to call them? Well, it was PSP. Was it strips? Yeah. yeah. PSP? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, perforated steel. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, yeah that so was, uh, they, they had to land on that, and uh, the guy did a phenomenal job. And when he came, uh, when he got landed and, and shut down and everything else, you know, you, you look through the, the tail rotor, and it was one bullet, went right straight through the tail rotor and hit the, just the cable, and hit the cable, and... Uh, and uh, luckily, you know, everybody was fine, and, and the, the guy that was on the, the aircraft, he actually went home in uh, uh, the latter part of February, so this was kind of towards his last mission, so he was pretty lucky there. And even helicopters that are on skids, right? Not, they don't have wheels or anything Correct. to land on, so you're getting a scrape across this corrugated yes. steel matting, which... Lots of sparks, yeah. and, you know, and at 60 knots, it, you know, you come to a, a pretty quick stop, yeah, too. Friction kicks yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was kind of exciting. And uh, okay, from there we had, uh, okay, we, okay, in the lot after that, a two-week period of gunships flew 690 sorties, expending 160,500 rounds of 7.26, 7 7.62, mm -hmm. 2,615 rounds of 40 millimeter and 1,771 uh, 2.5 inch rockets. Uh, we had an estimated of 142 uh, KBA. What's KBA mean? Killed by air or something? Killed by air? Oh, Could no, be. Not, not 53 body structures body. damaged and 44 structures uh, destroyed. Uh, we earned a, uh, okay, we had the direct support of the 101st at, in Fang Rang. And on March 4th, uh, uh, we got a, uh, let's see, what did we get? We had a distinguished uh, uh, some kind of a, an award. So your unit gets... Yeah, yeah, you got a unit citation. Beginning of May, uh, May we began flying convoy cover for elements of the 1st Cav. Uh, we uh, supported Operation Matthews, which was the 4th Infantry Division. And then the uh, 10th Combat Aviation Battalion gave the command of execution, placed the operational support to the unit to the Camp Holloway at Pleiku. So, you know, we support a lot of different areas and of a lot of different uh, 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 areas of operation and, uh, and support. Uh, so, let's see. In, in May, I decided, uh, okay, I'm going home in June. So I decided to give up my helicopter at that point, and, uh, and at that point I became a three-quarter ton truck driver in Dong Batin. So uh, from that point on, uh, you know, I just drove back and forth to, to uh, Cameron Bay to pick up supplies and occasionally and, uh, uh, and deliver, you know, some of the, the hooch maze that uh, were at uh, our base to take care of us. But uh, during that time, uh, a buddy of mine who uh, was from California, a guy by the name of Rick Leal, he, uh, you know, our weapon of, of issue was a 38 uh, Smith & Wesson uh, revolver. 
That's the only weapon we had in Vietnam other than our M60 machine guns that were on the helicopter. So uh, he bought a holster, Western style holster, and tied it around his thigh. And he, he, uh, we had uh, my duty that, that night about oh, five, six o'clock was uh, to take the hooch baits uh, back to their village in a three quarter ton truck, which was probably five miles away or so. So uh, as we're waiting for the, the hooch baits to get done with their duties and stuff like that, he says, hey, I've been practicing this, watch this. So he draws his gun and as he draws his gun, we, I hear a bang. And he, this guy had shot himself in the thigh and it went through his calf and had, it just had enough velocity to stop in his blouse boot. So when he says, hey, I shot myself, he says, we, we got to go to uh, the uh, dispensary. Yeah, the dispensary. So, so uh, I took him over there, and uh, as he took off his pants, he heard the, the, the bullet dropped out. You know, it had just enough velocity to get through that flesh. And uh, I don't know if he even heard, heard a Purple Heart or not, but uh, uh, at that point on, uh, I got another guy who is uh, kind of a California hippie, Hans Werner von Herm, and uh, him and I went to, uh, uh, to take the guys back. He had shotgun and he had an uh, uh, AR-15. And uh, we took the, uh, the hooch baits back and when we got back, uh, you know, I was ordered the next day to report to the company commander to, you know, talk about what had happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, uh, when he took those hooch maids back last night, that the village got hit. You know, just after I had dropped them off and was on my way back home. You know, I said, oh my goodness, that was that was another close call. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, it was pretty much smooth sailing from that point on, and uh, uh, got my orders to return home on. Uh, uh, January, uh, uh, June, January, June uh, 29th, and uh, flew from uh, from uh, Cameron Bay to uh, Tokyo, and then from Tokyo to uh, Seattle, and ETS out of Seattle, and through from Seattle to uh, to St. Joe, back to St. Joe, and uh, through into Ross Field. God bless Ross Field. And uh, surprised my mom and dad. They had a, a sign up, you know, welcome home, Jim. They knew I was coming home pretty soon, but didn't know when. But I took a cab from uh, the airport to the actual home and, uh, and then uh, had a little celebration uh, with family and stuff like that when I got home. That's and good. from that point on, Vietnam was a distant memory for 38 years almost. All right, well, I want to talk a little bit more post Vietnam later, but I want to go back and fill in some other dimensions of the experience. You mentioned at some point flying into Cambodia and things like that. Yes. Do you remember about that? Yeah, we, uh, we supported the mountain yards, which were uh, in the Cambodia, Cambodia, Laos area, uh, up in the mountains. Uh, we did some uh, single ship missions with them, supporting them, and, uh, and uh, talk about uh, third world. You know, they were, they were almost, you know, almost like cannibals, you know, they were, but Sincere people, you know, really interesting people, and uh, but uh, very primitive, and uh, uh, you know, the we only probably threw maybe six, eight, ten missions in uh, the Cambodian, you know, in basically it was flying over there and, and occasionally uh, dropping some some people in to, to take you know uh, a measure of what the what the enemy uh, traffic is going on there. So were you bringing special forces? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Do you ever like you know CIA yeah. or anything like that or? No, it was uh, it was military. Okay. Uh, and they were you know we would drop them off. It was kind of like uh, the long range patrol. You know mm -hmm. we, you know when when we dropped off long range patrol, we had like five helicopters that would fly in a straight line, mm -hmm. and usually the first and second had the the actual troops in them, which would be maybe three or four troops. That would uh, it was dusted on. We drop them off and. The, the helicopter would drop down and they keep flying and then once they drop them off they come back uh, and get in the rear of the, the formation so if, you know if somebody looked up and, and then looked down you know they really wouldn't see people being dropped off but uh, and would that happened occasionally. Would you do sort of decoy drops in other places? Would you maneuver? Yeah, yeah. We, we actually did, yeah. yeah. So they yeah. couldn't tell exactly where people were being inserted. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then you'd have, and would you then go and pick them up in the and, morning? At, at dawn, yeah. Yep. Yeah.
Sometimes they'd be out there two, three days, so. So, and matter of fact, my, uh, my Christmas tree was interrupted uh, uh, to, to save some of the guys that uh, we, somebody had dropped them off right next to a Viet Cong battalion. Oh. And uh, they said, you know, can you get us out of here? <laughs> so they, they moved a few clicks uh, uh, in the other direction and, and we picked them up and uh, kind of actually probably saved their lives, you know, and that was kind of a neat thing to do on Christmas. Talk a little bit more about the Koreans. What kind of impression did you have of them? The Koreans, uh, you know, they were uh, short, uh, stocky, and they would just beat us, each other up just for fun, you know. And, you know, we always thought they were crazy. But uh, we didn't have a whole lot of interaction with them because uh, they pretty much kept to themselves. But uh, every time we would fly right directly over their, their, the uh, portion that they were uh, looking after, and... Uh, they would be, you know, wrestling and, and uh, you know, shooting off uh, grenades, launchers, and, and things like that, just uh, just for fun, you know. And occasionally, uh, uh, one of our guys might get into a little tiff with them, and uh, you didn't get in the tiff with the Korean because they they were pretty good fighters. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, did you get an R and R while you were in Vietnam? I uh, was scheduled to go on R and R in uh, March. They found out I was going to ETS in June. They says, I'm sorry, your 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 R&R is canceled. My luggage went to uh, Australia with another guy, but uh, I never did get R&R, &R, no. Okay. So I guess you were a little bit unusual. You spent a lot of time in the States out of your two-year enlistment before you went over. Correct. If you had been in the States maybe much longer, they wouldn't have sent you out of the country at all. We went over as a unit with guys that had a month left. Okay. So uh, uh, grunts that were gunners on uh, ships, you know, and uh, I remember one guy, Mike Milliken from Chicago, he said, I don't know what the hell I've got over here. I says, I, I'm going home in a month. You know, he was just really angry about it and uh, continued to be angry until he, he got sent home. But uh, uh, we had guys that, uh, you know, went in March, February, April, you know, ets out. And that's kind of what uh, uh, kept the unit together because, uh, you know, all the guys that trained together, uh, they got a little bit uh, replacement at a time, so it, it still remained a cohesive unit. Okay. Uh, how would you characterize unit morale over the course of the time you were there? Uh, I would say always pretty high. You know, we, you know, of course, December uh, when we lost our first casualties, uh, it was a it was a sad time, and uh, uh, we had a couple other uh, people that were shot and. Uh, uh, we had a couple guys that had a distinguished flying cross, and uh, uh, some guys that had chest wounds that were saved by uh, uh, their crew chiefs. Uh, so you know we had a, a couple lifesavers, but uh, all in all, uh, you know we lost uh, 22 guys in the uh, the entire length that we were over there. Uh, but uh, you know, being having a mother to pray for me, you know, I'm kind of glad I, I wasn't one of them. Okay. Uh, now, one of the common things often suggested, particularly by helicopter crews and door gunners and so forth, is that they could be kind of wild people. Uh, drugs, women, other things like that. I mean, was there much of that kind of stuff going on on base? There, there was a little bit of that, but, uh, you know, there, there was the opposite also. The, the guys that uh, be kept their, sh their aircraft spick and span and, uh, you know, after some operations, you know, literally we'd have to wash down the aircraft from blood and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, most of them were pretty dedicated. Uh, uh, I saw very little uh, wildness going on. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, uh, of course, the, the drinkers. You know, I, I really wasn't a drinker at the time and uh, uh, never have been. But uh, uh, there were some guys that really, you know, would, would get drunk. But uh, when it came time for the call of duty, we, mm -hmm. we had 100%. Uh, we never had a, a, a unit that uh, uh, was called upon that didn't answer the call. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, our, you know, zero defects was our, our motto, and we fly for freedom was, uh, was our, uh, our patch. And uh, matter of fact, me and uh, another guy in, uh, in March of that year were assigned to, to make a patch for the, uh, the 92nd, and him and I designed this patch here right here 
And this patch went up with Shane Kimbrough in, uh, on the uh, Discovery in space. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this patch that him and I designed, you know, we were given the, the uh, assignment by a, a, a sergeant. Uh, you guys designed a patch. He, he pretty much, I designed the, the V, mm -hmm. the flight, we fly for freedom. And he had been drawing this eagle as a kid all the time. And so we, we kind of figured out the shape. And I give most, most of the credit to him, but uh, uh, in the, the little uh, up and down here, that was for the mountains of Colorado, for where we came from. And, uh, and uh, 48 years ago, that's, uh, that was what we did. Okay. So basically, the performance level of your unit was consistently high. You did your exactly. Job, you did your job well. It was very so high. That, that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, do they make any effort to encourage you to stay? Uh, half, you know, most of the people, they, they had their mind made up whether they were gung-ho or not. We had one guy that did six tours mm -hmm. in Vietnam. He was uh, uh, the guy that uh, in the control tower. So, you know, he was there for a long time. But uh, uh, most of our guys were, were in and out. A lot of RAs and, and, uh, and U.S. Uh, draftees uh, that, that served together. And uh, 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 everybody that, that I saw and, uh, and knew did, did their job and did it well. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and now uh, when you finally you get back home, uh, and you say, okay, you got yourself back home. On your way back from Vietnam, when you got to the U.S., uh, you go to Washington, or Fort Lewis, or uh, Seattle, I forgot the, or the, It was the Seattle. Yeah. Okay. So I, I forgot the, the actual name of the, the base. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then, uh, did they warn you at all about war protesters or things like that? They did. They did. And, uh, you know, of course, I knew from past experience, you know, in watching television, uh, prior to going over there that uh, uh, there were a lot of people against the war and uh, basically I was one of them. You know, I, I was what, what they call a reluctant veteran. I did not want to go, but when I was called, I, I served. But uh, and when you flew home, did you do it in uniform? I did. And uh, when I got home, that was the first thing I took off and, and didn't look at it for another 30 years or so. Okay. So, so you didn't have any trouble on the way home? No, no, because you know you fly into a, uh, I flew in Chicago, went right from Chicago to, to Northwest uh, North Central Airlines back then. Yeah. Uh, my first flight was on a DC three, you know, back then. So, uh, but when I, when I got home, that uh, that uniform came off and uh, went in the closet and uh, uh, was never thought of since. You know, it was, you know, I was happy that I served, and you know, of course, uh, back then. It, they were calling Vietnam baby killers and everything else, and uh, uh, so I wanted to, to put a lot of distance between that. As a matter of fact, on July 4th, you know, I got home June 29th. On July 4th, I was in Saugatuck, listened to the, the Flock and the MC5, and you know, they had a big uh, uh, festival up there, and uh, Vietnam was the last thing on my mind. And I promised myself when I got home, I'd get a MGB or a sports car and a motorcycle. Got the motorcycle first. My father says, you dumb shit. He says, here you go to Vietnam, you come home, and here you buy a motorcycle. What's with that? You know, he didn't speak to me for like two weeks <laughs> until I bought a, a car. And, he, and he, as soon as I drove up in the MGB, he says, hey, let's go for a ride. That was kind of my first words he said to me in two weeks. After that, I never touched the motorcycle again, sold it right off the bat. and. Uh, and stay with the uh, the sports car. Uh, had you just saved money while you were in the army? I that? did, you know, uh, not a whole lot, but I, I went right right back to work at Heath Company, you know, because they had the, the policy. I was I worked there a year, was two years in the, the service, and went back and worked another uh, three years until I moved to Chicago, and then, uh, uh, but after you know after that it was, uh, you know, Vietnam was the last thing on my mind. And so, what kind of career did you go into? You know, uh, ironically enough, uh, kind of maintenance. You know, I, I actually was a salesman for a little while for McCormick and Company Spices. I was uh, a division transportation rate technician uh, for uh, Kraft Foods. And then uh, uh, later on, I, I got into maintenance. I was a, a, a chief engineer for Rush Presbyterian St. Louis Medical Center, Chicago, a big hospital there. 
And uh, uh, when I moved back here, I, I worked for in, in maintenance at uh, Heath Company uh, for, for a year. And then, uh, then my career took off uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, always loving television growing up and stuff like that. I bought my first camera and then uh, uh, became Hindsight Video, H-E-Y-N, Sight mm -hmm. Video. And uh, have enjoyed a, a 30 year career doing that. So it's, it's been a good life. All right. Uh, to look back now at the time that you spent in the Army, uh, how do you think that affected you or what did you take out of it? Oh, it's completely changed my life. You know, uh, uh, I wasn't really smart enough to get into college. I, uh, school wasn't, was not uh, a big priority with me. Uh, girls were in dancing and, and, you know, I went to the, I wanted to be a surfer, you know. I wanted to go to California. I, I, I didn't want to fight in a war or anything else. I just wanted to be a... Uh, civilian dancing, you know, having fun kind of kid, and uh, uh, that was interrupted. But it, you know, the service changed my life, gave me discipline, uh, gave me a, a, a career that I could count on. You know, I did. I didn't go into aircraft maintenance, and you know, around here, there just wasn't a whole lot of jobs mm -hmm. there. But uh, uh, having that kind of background gave me credence uh, uh, and support for for other areas that I, I went into. Okay, and you said you you put. The, not all the stuff behind you and for like 30 mm -hmm. years and so forth. Um, what changed that? How did you wind up reconnecting with veterans? Well, uh, back in 2005, uh, probably about 2004 or so, uh, I looked up 92nd Assault Helicopter Company. And lo and behold, there was a website, 92nd AHC, that popped up. And I was on literally on the, that site for probably 25, six hours straight. You know, just, they had everything. They had our papers going over. They had a, a, a history of the unit. They had uh, uh, papers, pictures, and everything else. And just the memories just came flooding back. You know, and I was, uh, uh, started getting hold of some of the guys that I, I had served with. And uh, in 2005, we had our first reunion. And it was out in, uh, in uh, Manitou Springs, which is real close to Colorado Springs, where we served as a unit, and uh, uh, getting together with those guys and everything else, it was just uh, uh, a super emotional experience, and uh, to, to see them, and and uh, actually it was less we forget also back in 2006, uh, uh, seeing the the World War II veterans and hearing their stories, and 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 talking about uh, you know how they served I, I says you know I've, I've got stories like that too and uh, and and seeing you know some of these the greatest generation you know talk about their experiences in, in the service it was a, a moving experience for me and uh, you know and I thank God for those uh, those World War II veterans and uh, the Korean veterans after them and uh, and uh, my brother was serving in the Air Force also in uh, during the 50s but uh, he ended up being a, a clerk in, uh, in uh, Lackland Air Force Base, so he was in the Air Force for four years. But, uh, you know, my brother and I are the, the only family members that served. My father didn't because he had five kids, and, and uh, uh, the war was almost yeah. over when, uh, when uh, he had uh, his fourth, so. All right. Well, it makes for a good story, so thank you very much for sharing it today. My pleasure. Thank you.